And we're, <laughs> I think we were at Smedley's that night, right? Yeah. And, and so this is all happening right in a live it's time. Right called that week. They said, I really want to do this tune, but we got to do it in A instead and of C sharp. And here's, yeah, so we, we, he trans, so Mike starts it off. Dun, 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 and all of a sudden, you know, and all of a sudden I came over me to pl to play the Mary Clayton part, you know, that she sings that. Yeah. Ooh, On guitar. I went, with the violin sound, like Phil Kiegi or something oh, yeah, like that, you know. And as soon as we did that a couple times, four times, and then Billy just went, da, 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 and just, it just it just came alive. It's just like, what the hell just happened? It was like, it was something magical. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Level Up Cleveland. And this week, we have the guys in here from Armstrong Bearcat. That's right. And we're going to introduce everybody from left to right. Armstrong Bearcat means, of course, we have Butch Armstrong, plays lead guitar, also vocals for the band. Yay! Yay, I'll fight for you. <laughs> yes, Hooray! And to his left, we have the bass player, Mike Barrick. Hello. He also does some singing. Does also yes, some sir. vocals in the band also. And to his left, we have Billy Coakley, drummer. Yay. All Yay. phenomenal Yay. musicians. These guys are all phenomenal musicians, all of them. I mean, this is a, this is a, a top, top, top notch band in the, in the area. If you're, if you're ever in the mood to go see the, some of the top, top musicians in Cleveland, this is the band to go see. Um, playing mostly covers. And and basically, like a lot of the blues, uh, southern rock, a lot of the older rock and stuff like that. But anything that's got a lot of really good guitar in it and a lot of great, oh yeah, th that's what you guys are going to play. Um, excellent, excellent band. Now, what I want to do is I want to kind of go back and tell some of the history of what you guys, because you guys have all three of you, a lot of history in music, uh, a lot of things that pe some people probably don't even know about. That gets you to this point where you're at right now. Um, start with Butch because you sit in the pilot seat and then we'll work our way on down. We'll talk about everybody and see, see what we can learn today. Cool. But Butch, you started off young, started off young and you had a brother also that played music with you. Yeah. And, um, I want to talk about that a little bit because that's kind of how it all starts. Right. I mean, right there, that's when you kind of get the bug a little bit. Right. And, and cause you're, you're playing in a band already and you're, so you're, 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 you're playing with your brother, your brother Vito, Right. Tell me a little bit about that. What's it like growing up? What was what was the times like for you back then? Well, we started uh, really young. He was eight, and I was t basically ten. But before that, we had listened to music a lot. You know, I mean, most people say, "Oh, the Beatles were their biggest influence," which is true. But for us, it was a lot different. My father would bring records home from the local jukebox guy. You know, after they ran their course in the jute boxes, he'd say, take these home to your fam family. It was mostly albums. So I listened to uh, music from the time I was four years old, you know, until I decided to learn how to play an instrument. And most of it was big band stuff and, and Frank Sinatra, uh, Jerry Vale, all the Italian Italian crooners. My father liked Jerry Vale, Perry Como. He loved Perry Como and... Um, you know, uh, it was Tony Bennett, Dean, yeah, right. Dean Martin. Uh, everybody was from the 50s and, and the big band orchestra stuff. And my first love was the trombone, and I begged my father for a trombone, and he and he actually uh, brought one home. It was more of a, a student model that was half toy and half real, you know. And I was so young, I couldn't the sound out of that yeah right 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 but my mother taught me how to put the records on the old victrola you know and i used to put them on and my brother was two and uh the, the, there was three records i always played over and over and over again and one of the, one of the famous one was uh honky tonk by bill doggett and 
nowadays you hear it in the beds of movies all over the place, but it was like a really big bluesy song, really bluesy song. And uh, Fats Domino and Elvis Presley. I remember seeing Elvis Presley at my grandma's house when he was on Ed Sullivan on the little old-fashioned TV. And every, all the cousins were crowded around. All my cousins were older than me. You know, we were the youngest, and they were like you know, teenagers. And they're watching Elvis, and my gr- aunt would be ironing, you know, and grandma's watching, and go, oh, yeah, I'll never make it, you know. <laughs> Funny <laughs> how that so works. So that's, that's how I started, you know, getting interested in music. Now, you said you had um, older cousins that were, that, you know, did yeah. that, do you think that that helped form what happened? What, yeah. Because I, you had the influences? Yeah, that- my, my, uh, one of my older cousins, Tommy, uh, was a, a, a keyboard uh, piano player. He was uh, taking piano lessons, and he was great. He was uh, about five, six years older, and, and we used to go sleep over their houses. You know, uh, we took turns sleeping over on Fridays nights and stuff and uh, every weekend. And, and before we watched Goulardi, <laughs> if I remember that guy, uh, which was, was the highlight of the weekend, uh, Tommy would be getting ready to go out on a date, and then he'd sit by the piano and he'd play us little Richard and, you know, and like, good golly, Miss Molly, and he'd sing it and play it, and we just just sit there and go, God, when I grow up, I want to be like Tommy. You yeah, know? that's cool, though. So that's kind of how it, that's how we all started. And I had a cousin, Johnny, that his, he, his uh, uncle bought him this his guitar, or electric guitar. It's the first time I ever saw electric guitar. And it was on an Easter Sunday or one of those holidays where everybody was... Uh, Funny, all the older Italian people would all go down the basement. That's where they le- cooked everything, and you know, with they had kitchens all, in their basements, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're all dressed up from church, and they, you know, corsages on and everything, and cold cement basement, block cement basement, you know, and the <laughs> big stove down there, and all the spaghetti's laid out. And after the whole thing was, you know, halfway through the party, uh, they wanted Johnny to go get the guitar, you know, and he had this big giant Gibson three fifty. Uh, what it, I don't know what it was then, but it's it's a 350, and it was uh, kind of like what Chuck Berry used, and it was a 1961 brand new, and he had an amplifier with tremolo, and he knew three songs, and uh, one was Malaguena, uh, Spanish Eyes by Frank Martino, and then one of the big famous groups back then, the electric guitar groups, was Pipeline, the song Pipeline, and he played these three songs over and over again. He was about 12 Oh, you know, and I was six, seven or eight, maybe, and he just entertained everybody, you know, with they put the tremolo on, and we could, we just died. We go, oh my god, electric guitar, and you plug it in the wall. Yeah, nothing like it. You know, it wasn't as common, right? I mean, you didn't see these all. Over electric the place. guitar was a new thing, and even the advertisements you'd see was like, try the new electric guitar. <laughs> you know, that's, <laughs> that's wild. <laughs> You know, the, if you see these old advertisements in the in the guitar books, you know, you know with fast tremolo action. <laughs> and who was the first couple? Who was like the first one selling electric guitars? Like, what was it? Was Gibson one of the first, or was it was? Uh, well, it was a toss up. Actually, Rickenbacker was one of the first. There's a big toss up and argument about who invented the pickup. You know, they say Rickenbacker, or they say Gibson, they say Fender. Uh, I'm not really. Uh, well, from what I understand, though, that there was yeah. I wouldn't make it on electric Jeopardy, guitar but twenties and thirties. <laughs> Charlie Christian played electric guitar. Yeah, they. I mean, it's it was it's it was around for a while, but it was pretty rare. But then it started to become popular, and uh, crazy thing is, after all those years, I I own that guitar now. Oh. <laughs> Johnny, ga- Johnny gave me that guitar. Well, you have an incredible memory. I got to be honest with you. You remember all this stuff from a long time ago, and you remember the songs. You remember the the artists and everything. It's amazing. All the good things. I remember. Yeah, that's what, that's cool. It's, it, it, you know, it's funny too. It doesn't right. matter how much you've experienced. You never forget the firsts, right? The firsts always somehow stay in there. Well, that's you know, t- cousin Tommy and, and and cousin Johnny were the first two influences on me. Yeah, right, right, right. You know, and I, I remember going home in the car that night and. Uh, I said, Dad, I want to play guitar, too. You know, just take a little kid, you know. I want a candy bar, too, you know, kind of <laughs> attitude. And oh, that's, a, that's a professional instrument now, and he's taking lessons on that. He says, when you get a little older, maybe we'll talk about it, you know. And then we kind of forgot about it. And basically, by the time I was seven, um, you know, we love music, but my goal in life was to be a Cleveland Indian. I mean. Really? That's, that's, uh, baseball. All I did was play baseball every day. 
day. You know, I used to put five packs of, you know, bubble gum in my mouth from the, pl- from the <laughs> trading cards. And we used to trade cards and flip cards and, you know, me and the kids around the neighborhood. And, uh, you know, if you flip the card, even some odds, you know. I don't know if you know what, what I'm talking about. No. You, you win the other guy's card. Oh, you know oh, I mean? yeah, 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 yeah. Right. You would flip them, and it was like yeah. two cards together, and yeah. you, you win them both. So if you had evens, you know, you if, you if you chose evens, and they both came out even, then you win the cards. Yeah, right, right, right. And we'd start fighting and arguing about the cards, and, you know, every, we had butch haircuts, you know, and <clears throat> we had, uh, I used to wake up and put a baseball uniform on all day. So that was my that was my life. I mean, Rocky Calavito and Tito Francona were my favorite Cleveland Indians. And we actually got That's to meet cool. Rocky Calavito. No kidding. Yeah. Before the trade. Yeah. How'd was, you feel about the trade when that happened? That was pretty devastating, huh? Well, it just even the ch- the name change in the last year or so was just was like de- I was just really mad about it. I mean, I mean, it's I I'm sorry. That's just the way I feel. Still. Oh yeah. It's like it's sacrilegious. You know, the Cleveland Indians, the Cleveland Indians. That's how serious I was about that. You know, and then, uh, then then we saw the Beatles. You know, and that kind of like solidified uh, everything that you were already well, thinking. Kind of, <laughs> we were getting a little too old to play baseball, and if unless, unless you're going to go professional, you know, uh, actually the pitches when I when I started getting older, I was playing against kids that were two or three years older than me, and and the pitching was so fast, it was like I didn't realize how fast they pitched. Yeah, right, right, right. You know, and it's, it was kind of scary a little it, bit. You catch up to the, the competition after a yeah. while as you get older with baseball and yeah, sports and when stuff. we were kids in the backyard playing, we didn't pitch that fast. We pitched to hit it. Right, right. <laughs> we yeah, didn't sure realize they're pitching, so you can't hit it. Once it hits like 85 right. miles an hour, it looks a little different. Oh, right. <laughs> if you could see it. If you could even so. see it. So then, So then you get a guitar. And do you become kind of obsessive at that point with learning this thing? Is there something inside you that may, or, or does that take time before you we get had, to? We had $40 saved up, and my mother was at a grocery store, and across the street was a little music music store called Gene Beecher's. And Beecher Brush, it was Gene Beecher and Howard Brush, and they were both orchestra people, you know, and they were in their 60s. And uh, there was a guitar in the window for 40 bucks. It was just a box guitar. We go, hey, we got 40 bucks, you know, from saving our birthday money and communion money and, you know, Christmas money, little envelopes. And uh, we begged my father to come with us one day. And then uh, he just, uh, you know, he's talking to the owner and we're just bouncing around this guitar and like just banging on it, you know. And here, let me try it. You know, just going like this, you know. And uh, he says, I said, what do you think, Dad? We got the money. Could we buy this guitar? He goes, put that away. He says, I just made you a deal for that. Melody Maker, Gibson Melody Maker on the wall in that Skylark amp. It was about a $175 guitar and a $75 amp. That's a lot of money, then. With the guitar cord, you know, they put the through the guitar cord in it. And we just died, like, oh, my God. He, really, he, says, he, says, he says, I'll buy it for you in one condition. is you start lessons with Cousin Johnny and his teacher, you know, this Saturday. And, you know, and you're going to learn how to read music, you know. And he says, that's the deal. I go... Yeah, okay. And so we took lessons for a couple months, you know. And uh, basically we didn't uh, read too good. <laughs> it was really hard. It was kind of monotonous, too. I mean, the way they taught it, you know. And uh, and then we started playing by ear, you know. And just putting the records on and figuring out, you know, our own stuff. I mean, you're saying us now. This is you and Vito, your brother, yeah. at this time? But I... I he played a little bit. I played a little bit better than him. So we had a band together with our cousin Frankie down the street. He wasn't really a cousin. He was his father was just my brother's godfather, and uh, he had a drum set. He his father actually bought him a real Rogers drum set, thousand dollar drum set, Sparkles, Silver Sparkle. And so he, he had a drum set. We had a guitar and an amp, and hey, we got to get a band together. And we didn't realize it, but. Every band's got a bass player. What's a bass player? You know, we just, we were so backwoods. And we just told my brother, you're playing bass. He goes, I don't want to play bass. He says, no, you're going to play bass. We need a bass player. you got to play bass. So we switched him from guitar lessons to bass lessons. I see. And uh, the bass they gave him the rent to go home was like a giant, giant bass. Like, you know, and he was such a little tiny kid. You know, then we finally got him a Beatle bass, and that even looked like a 335 on him. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. it was a little clearer, a Beatle bass. And, man, he skyrocketed on that thing. 
I mean, he, he became the front man, the lead singer, and that led us to playing a, a private party across the street. This guy, Jack, heard us in the garage playing. He goes, hey, you guys want to play my party this Saturday? And we're like, wow, a real gig? <laughs> you know, so we, that's what we did. We played, we played three songs. i never forget. It was Little Black Egg, Twist and Shout, and Louie Louie. We played those same three songs all night long. <laughs> over and over, just kept playing. <laughs> that was all we knew. <laughs> and uh, it was a bunch of 35-year-old people at the time, you know. It was kind of like a, Ritz, you know, it was in Pepper Pike, and that's where we grew up, you know, and it's the, that neighborhood started to become, uh, we moved there, there was nobody living there. It became it was, affluent after it, a while, well, Pepper it's, Pike. It's like a, yeah, it's a high-class neighborhood yeah. now. But when we first moved there, it was still Amish buggies going down the road. Oh, really? Yeah, you know, yeah. There like, was no couple of houses on the street. Our street was like a dirt road. And then they finally paved it, and it was, you know, it was like in the country. Yeah. And then uh, one party led to another, and this one lady kind of discovered us, and she said, I work for WHK Radio. You know, and she says, I want to uh, I want to get permission from your parents to manage you guys. I think I can do something with you. And they said, go ahead, go for it. You know, and so she got us on national television. She got us on the Upbeat Show. No kidding. You know, David Spiro's dad, you know. And uh, she got us on the Jerry G show. He was a DJ that was on Wixie, I think, Channel 3. We were actually on television with Neil Diamond, his debut. Yeah. But he was on wow. film. Wow. Yeah. But the Upbeat show was real exciting. Wow. Yeah. And how old are you guys at this time about? At that time, uh, Vito was 10, I was 12. Wow. Yeah, we had played for a couple of years, you know, and one party led to an ex, and, and actually... Uh, the rich, uh, one of the original choreographers for the Upbeat show was Jeff Kutash and the Upbeat Dancers. He took a liking to us, and we were doing private gigs with him. He took a couple go-go girls out with him, and he'd you know, be doing dances, and we were the band backing him up. Wow. And he ended up going to Las Vegas and being a big-time choreographer out there. I think he's still working. Wow. So, And you guys are doing these parties because obviously you're too young to do yeah. anything else. This is all you can do is parties. You can't go play at a bar or anything like that. And then the craziest point. thing happened at... at, at uh, on that television show was a group, I think they were called the Kirby Stone Trio or the Kirby Stone Four. And we didn't find this story out till I was 18 years old. The, my parents kept it from us. But they discovered us and they wanted us to take us to Las Vegas with them to open up a brand new hotel called the Caesars Palace. Oh my it's 1967. God. <laughs> and be the warm up back. Take us out of school, just like they took the Jacksons out of school. And, and and be the act, you know, maybe even the whole family moved to Vegas, you know. And uh, I won't mention who it was, but one of the fathers of one of the guys in the band said, no, my son's not going to be no musician. He's going to go to college. And that kind of blew the whole thing. And now, is there three of you guys in the band? Four. Oh, I was going to say, because I can narrow this down really quick. Yeah, we had a... <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> Yeah, we had a, there was an extra, we we had to edit a keyboard player. Oh, okay, I got you. Uh, and uh, and our parents said, okay, well, so and so's father said uh, said no, so it's no. Just don't tell the kids. And I didn't find out till I was eighteen years old. Wow. I was answering an ad in a newspaper with a guitar in my hand and getting in my car. And my dad goes, "Where are you going?" I said, "I'm answering an ad, like looking for getting a band." He goes. Man, I never knew you guys were that serious about this. He says, I got to tell you something. And he told me the story, and I just died. I go, Dad, that was our big break. That could have led to all these other great things, you know. And uh, just, just our parents and our uncles and our relatives just were not entertainment people. Well, and let's you know? be honest, though. I mean, you hear it a lot. You know, parents never think that their kids are going to do anything with music. It's always a pipe dream. It's always, you know, this is how it's always viewed by parents when yeah, it comes well, to their kids. And then you always hear the stage dads and the stage moms that, w that will do anything to make their kids famous. Yeah, right. I mean, I still have people coming over with it's young true. kids going, hey, isn't my kid great? He's going to be something someday, isn't yeah. he? And I'm thinking, I get jealous. I go, why didn't my father act like that with me? You yeah. Know, it's like I get mad. It's like even at my age, I go, I can't believe it. You know, they, the kid's got no talent at all, and the father's like wants them to be. You know, I, uh, I want to see him play guitar. I want. You know, it's like. Well, if you, but here's the thing. You know, if anything changed in your life from where it happened, maybe you don't grow up to be Butch Armstrong, and that's a big thing. 
Oh yeah, Every, everything, turned out to be pretty good, right? Everything happens the way it happens. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, like, you, you wouldn't be here probably, and I would be pissed. Well, who knows what? Who knows what could have happened? You know, we, you're right. I mean, we could have been childhood stars and ended up being drug addicts and OD. You know, you're right. It's, like, it's true. You can't handle sometimes all that huge fame. It's hard to handle. Not everybody comes out of it on the other side. You know, childhood I mean? fame. Right. You're right. Yeah. No, you're right. Exactly. I think about that all the time. Yeah. It's just that we actually. It, it, we it actually we actually uh, we actually had the end to do that anyway. Yeah. Okay. Because the people in my family were affiliated with the Teamsters Union. Oh, so you and, had some connections along the way. And it, came, and it came out years later that they built the Caesar's Palace Hotel. Yeah. Wow. You know, like the movie Casino. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, but, uh, but but the thing I'm proud about is we actually got really legitimately discovered by another band, though. You know. That's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all the way around the story is crazy it is though but but it, it also like it's not as crazy as you think about when you think about what you've become and the fact that you're kind of like you were already I mean, you were already doing it at, at 12 years old i mean i mean were, if our uncles were into it with one phone call that it says put him in caesar's palace and then go, yeah right i mean it could have been, been that, that easy could have been that easy yeah all right i want to talk to mike now bass Hello player there. the bass player mike Mike, I've been watching you uh, on YouTube last week, and I gotta tell you, man, you're one of the more impressive bass players I think I've I've ever watched. Yay. I mean, like I, I it was, I, I, oh my god, do you ever play the same bass line twice in any song? It's like, <laughs> you know, I, I, I I'm just watching. And I'm like, how does he do this? He every doesn't. every bass line changes every <clears throat> single time, yeah. and the song flows perfectly and seamlessly yeah. well, partially because the about, drums are perfect one thing about this band is that we're all improvising a lot are you and that's why the covers are fun yeah because i would never want to be in a i don't want to diss anything but i mean we're not like tribute band kind of people where you play the same note oh every god night. oh thank god um this is more of uh, we're almost in a lot of ways this band is really exciting to me because i came up i mean the great thing is all three of us came from completely different backgrounds as you already said yeah you know, I was a trumpet player. Um, I went to college for it. I was in the Air Force Band. Uh, I know. I read that. It was awesome. And was, what was that like? What's the Air it Force? It was fun. Band? It was. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was really hard work. We worked our butts off. I would after I got out of college, I went to Ashland and uh, got an ed degree, and I was a band director for like a hot minute at, huh. in Mansfield. Wow. I was the junior high band director and assistant high school for so short, no kids would probably remember it. Because <laughs> what happened was the 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 Air Force Band played at our school. It was a jazz band, and they were awesome. And I didn't even know that existed. So I went right back in the backstage, and I was like, how do you do this? You know, full benefits to play trumpet in a jazz band? I didn't even, like I said, I didn't know I had that. So um, ended up doing an audition. Plus, I grew up on a farm in central Ohio, so the idea of even being a professional musician, just like with Butch's family, that was so... I think that's very foreign to every, almost every family. Yeah, you know? People make it in spite of those things, right? right? You know what I mean? And, you know, I never, for me, the music has always been everything. I don't care about being famous. I never did. It doesn't, what does that mean? You know, there's a lot of people that are famous for, I don't even know why. Yeah, right. Infamy exists also, so. Right. Well, one time my daughter and I were walking. My daughter's studying trumpet now at Cincinnati Conservatory. Ironically, she's in her right. junior year. She's doing great. And hi, Jessica. I'm lucky. I, my wife's a piano teacher, and we, we're just all music all the time, you know. We met in school. And um, one time my daughter and I were walking when she was maybe 10, and she goes, Dad, if you're as good at on bass as everybody says you are, how come you're not more famous? And I'm like, okay. Well, it's a legitimate question, to, right. to be honest with you, but... Well, I just turned to her and I said, answers. well, I knew her favorite place to get a hamburger was at this place called Hex in Tremont. And I go, well, what's the best place to get a hamburger? And she goes, Hex. And I go, not McDonald's? She goes, no. I go, they're more famous. Very good. Excellent. Famous and good are not the same thing. No, and you know. and, and, and since doing this podcast, we talk, talk about this all the time, the people that we get in here consistently are better, are more talented, are sometimes just better musicians in general than the national acts that you see up there all the time. Sometimes they're just better. For whatever reason, they're just not as famous or as rich or well, as whatever that goes along with some of the luck that gets that plays into it. Luck, 
for instance, what Butch just was talking about, right? If one thing changes, just a little something sure. changes, you don't know how the outcome it becomes now, and that might be the thing that happened that spawned one of these national acts to become so famous. Well, and, and it, 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 it really did kind of, once again, comes down to your goals. I mean, the finest musicians I know in this town are in the Cleveland Symphony, and you probably don't know any of their names. Yeah, right. Names don't mean anything there. That's yeah. Just, it's they're, the, they're some of the best musicians in the world. Yeah. And we don't know who they are. That's true. On the other hand, you take someone from a band like, well, I'm not going to say, but a typical three-chord rock band from the 90s, and that bass player is not any better than he was when he was 18 because he got rich when he was 18. He doesn't have to do what I had to do. I had to learn how to read music. I had to, I have to be able to play a polka. I have to be able to play country music. Uh, the, the deals that I've gotten in my, in my life um, with, with uh, other companies and stuff came through country music. Which uh, is not even my thing at all. Oh, I used to work for this Warner Brothers demo thing here in Cleveland when I first got out of the Air Force, and um, it was probably one of the best things that I ever did financially. But you know, I'm not, I'm not a country guy. I didn't want to do that. I just did it for these. They were demos for like Nashville because it was cheaper to record here than it was in Nashville. So we would contract musicians here and and do the demos for you know pretty big people like Reba McIntyre and stuff. Oh back wow! In the 90s. Oh wow! Wow! That's how I got to deal with Ernie Ball Music Man. So, as you're, how, how, what 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 exactly were you like influences, that kind of thing too? You know, like sure. what, were you the kind of bass player who was influenced? Well, you were not. You weren't a bass player though, really, at the time. Like, I would, yeah. Um, so I grew up on a farm kind of area outside of where Cyrus, Ohio is. I know, yeah, yeah. Down near Mansfield area. Yeah, my family's from Tiffin area, Tiffin oh, proper, and then my dad and I, we all lived on a farm. And uh, so my first um, real idea that I was wanted to be a musician was I just loved playing trumpet, and I was really into being in band and I, this would have been I think we moved back to Ohio I, we lived in Indiana for a while we moved back to Ohio when I was a freshman sophomore in high school and um, I really really loved trumpet and it was mostly this guy named Maynard Ferguson <clears throat> that I was a fanatic about he was like a screech trumpet player and I really wanted to do that really bad but I never thought about doing this as a business or as for a living this is a hobby type thing in your mind I thought something, I was going to be a draftsman. I really wanted to draw. I loved drawing. I loved all that kind of stuff. I did sketching all the time. And um, then I was practicing in the new school. We moved to a, this farm area outside of Osiris. It was called Winford High School, a real small school. And I was practicing in the band room. And um, this lady who I would just met, she was our school counselor. She pops her head in the band room. She's like, you sound really good on the horn. You should, uh, do you take lessons? And I'm like, no. At the time, my family was kind of broke. And uh, she was like, well, it just so happens I actually have a master's degree in trumpet in this little tiny school. And she goes, what do you want to take lessons? I said, we don't have enough money for that. And she's like, how about, her name's Jane Powell. She's still alive. And she, she's probably the main reason I'm sitting here talking to you guys. And uh, she just goes, how about if I give you free lessons every week? I'll meet you down at this elementary school. I got keys for it. If you can get there after school, I'll give you free lessons, but you got to show up every time and you got to practice everything I tell you to do. I'm like, sure. So we start doing it. And by the end of my junior year, I was like, you know, I want to go to college for this. I want to do this. You got the, you got the bug now, right? Yeah. The fever. <laughs> but once again, in our family and everybody's typically families, I mean, my dad was like, you can't make a living as a musician. That's impossible. And so I went and, and, and I got a music ed degree because I thought, well, I'll be a band director, you know, something to fall back on, like yeah, you always right. say. But then that's when um, the Air Force band played at the school I was teaching at. And then I auditioned and. I didn't think I was going to get in, but I did. And they only had one opening in the whole Air Force for this brass quintet, which was classical music, which was what I was studying at the time. So I took it and um, did it for 10 years. And then like two years after I was in, then my wife, who also went to college with me, she's a flute player, she joined because they had an opening for a flute. And uh, so we ended up getting to live in Illinois, south of Chicago, for six years. And then the, the last years I was in, in Japan. I lived in Tokyo for no like, kidding, like a little over three years. Why Tokyo? Like why Japan? Why, we I, got what? stationed there. Uh, they have a band there, oh. and you're attached to the embassy, and you work for public affairs, and you just do, 
you did concerts, you know? I mean, wow. you just did concerts. You That's know? awesome. It was really <laughs> awesome. And I was That's in a rock band, awesome. actually, over there. And Air Force, if you can believe that, we had a really good band. We were doing Van I believe Halen. it. Sure. We were doing everything from Van Halen to, wow. it was all the stuff that was popular. This would have been in 91 to, like, 94. Wow. So, I mean, we were, like, we had our own Learjet, and we got to tour all over the world. Yeah. Australia, Singapore, <sighs> Thailand, Korea. Um, pretty much Palau, Hawaii, any Pacific thing. You wow, know? playing the cool places too. Like, yeah, yeah, like yeah, this is... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, yeah, and man. that was, you know, we I was young then, so we had a lot of fun running around and just, you know, there was just a lot of stuff, uh, you know. Cool. So for me, that was my way off the farm, so to speak, was to just join the Air Force Band, do that. And then my wife's from Cleveland, so we decided we would try this. And I told her I'm going to give Cleveland one year. That was in 1994. I said, I'm going to give it one year. And if I'm not gigging, like I said, I never really cared that much about being famous. But my dream was mostly to do this. To just make money playing music with people that love playing music like these two guys. You're right. I mean, we're completely different people. I mean, everything about us is almost different. But not one thing is when we play together... I mean, I'll get emotional if I start talking about it too much. That's how much I love these guys. Well, go ahead. No, I'm just kidding. I will. I mean, I really, I really genuinely love playing with these guys. There's just That's a awesome. certain energy that we have that um, I think, in, in the, and it's always like this on-stage conversation. Because, you know, I'm kind of ADHD guy, man. I don't like to, you know, when I'm not playing music, I'm playing video games. And, you know, I like got to be doing something. I like got it. My, my new Xbox is one of my pals. <laughs> 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 yes, I'll admit that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I love the way we play. It's like we're, I love jazz. And we're like if, you know, uh, the closest I'm going to get to playing jazz in a rock setting is with these guys. Yeah, right. And it's not jazz rock. I mean, we're still playing rock. But you're playing the songs. I mean, like you. Sure. Yeah. It, it. We just have open areas. Like we'll play the tune, what you know, and then the middle part. Well, even even like the solos part, the guitar solos, right? I was I'm watching you guys, right. and the guitar solos, of course, Butch is one of the best guitar players around here. <laughs> Definitely. But you two guys, you guys don't like get cheated. This guy's my brother. You, you guys don't get cheated any, any at any point in this whole thing. Like if you, if there's a. Like I'm watching him play solos now. How many? How many? And how many bands? Guitar solos playing, bass players are playing root notes and just doing things just to fill the background. You don't do that, dude. Like you're like you're up there playing. Like I said, I don't think you play the the same bass line twice. I think I think it, it, it's. But, <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing. <laughs> but, but, yeah, but it's seamless. There's never there's never a mo like to the un like I'm watching for this stuff like this. I'm watching. Okay. And, and, I think to people who aren't really looking for that, to the ear, it sounds perfect. It flows perfect. There's nothing. But if you're watching what you're doing up there and all the things you're doing, it's like, well, he doesn't stop. It's just constant. It's, it's awesome. mostly a reaction. Part of it is. I love it. Butch lets. This is one of the most generous musicians I've ever worked with. And I mean on stage, generous. Yeah. You know, very. When you're a bass or a bass player, or a drummer, I mean, we are support instruments most of our lives. That's what we're supposed to do, right? Right, right, a, right. I, That's why I fell in love with it. You know, I, I started taking it on the road as a trumpet player. I would be sitting in the back of the bus because, you know, I'm touring in the 80s and 90s before cell phones. You've got a 17-hour bus ride. There's nothing to do except read a book or practice an instrument, and right. you couldn't practice a trumpet with 18 people on a bus. No, they would they'd kick you off. <laughs> so I just started bringing a bass in the back. But anyway... The way these guys, the, the, and that led to to me me wanting to play the bass and falling in love with it, but the way he, the way we we all three look at music is is it's more living and breathing, organic almost type. It's feeling. breathing. I, I really want people to feel like when they come and hear this band that they're not going to hear the same thing three nights in a row. Awesome, you know, and that keeps it really interesting to us, you know, because you know he might play something and then that makes me think, oh, I could do this. And, you know, you can't get too far away or it'll sound weird, you know. I mean, it's still rock and it's still, you know, more you know, a popular style of music, so you can't get, you know, turn it into a Yeah, but you guys, seem to, you guys seem to, through your experience and professionalism, know how to corral everything and keep it from spinning out of control like that. Because right. any one of you three, right. I'm, I'm pretty sure at any moment, if you really wanted to, could just go into a tailspin and just go off right. and become the focal point of the whole song. But you guys, even no matter what, even during a solo, okay, 
in most bands, you know, when Eddie Van Halen played a solo, you watched Eddie Van Halen, and that's right. who you watched. But with you guys, you could watch you for a little while, and then I could watch the bass player for a little while, and I could watch the drummer for a little while, because you're all kind of doing stuff that's just, like, amazing. It's the probably, all at the same time, you know? It's like, who do you watch? We're probably more in the tradition of, like, a cream. Yeah, right. I agree. As far as that. I totally agree with that. You know, that's that, that, an improv Or even, you know, more modern, like, you know, imp- uh, for lack of a better term, you know, bands like... It, it, the improvisation of like I'm trying to I'm kind of drawing a blank, but well, because there's fish, a more, yeah, okay, Grateful okay, Dead okay, maybe, yeah. but we're not noodly like that. So and I don't mean that. I mean we don't go as long. No, you don't have like the 25 minute jam song, right? I mean we have some, but it's not. It's gonna be. It's not gonna be that long because yeah. we got a lot. Of, we got a lot of tunes we got to do. Yeah, right, 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 right. And um, people are coming to hear specific stuff, so if we're trying to fit it all in, you know, we get a lot of requests. But we always keep playing anyway. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you guys know a lot of songs between the three of we you. Do. I'm sure you guys know a lot of songs. So requests aren't really like out of the question because you can handle a lot of requests because you can you know so many songs. It's, yeah. It, there is definitely a, a perk to knowing that many songs. And, and people do love the fact that they can do requests and you play them. That goes over in, a, in, a, in an audience. As long as it's, yeah, I mean, yeah, we, we kind of are in a certain yeah. area genre-wise. Like it's going to be 70s, 80s. Guitar rock, man. You guys yeah. play the guitar. This guy a lot heavy guitars. Yeah, man. Might, we might do it. Right, oh, yeah, right, 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 right. That's true. All right, I want to move over to Billy real quick. Billy hasn't had a chance to say much, oh. and and I got. I must say, dude, you're an awesome drummer too. Awesome musician. Unbelievable to watch. Maybe not necessarily a flashy, going crazy and flipping your sticks up in the air and doing all that stuff. But I'm telling you, man, your timing is like, it is. I'm watching you, and I'm like, he is, and you do it like. Dude, your your stage you have a stage presence as a drummer, which is the coolest thing to have in a band. Like drummers usually just sit in the background and they just play the drums, right? But like I found my my eyes were moving over to you a lot because you get up, you'll stand up and play the drums. You have you do things and and dude, you don't really look around. You look straight ahead and you can hit everything perfectly like you I'm telling you, it's wild, it's fun to watch and you're and not only that, but you're like your timing is Dead, nuts, man! You keep the band perfect. There's no, it's no. I can understand why these guys have you as their drummer. You're the perfect guy for this band. I, I, I would have to, band. I would have to yeah. think so. I mean, like, amazing. The three of you guys, amazing, are, are together are amazing, and you definitely are a huge part of why, for sure. So, how do you get started playing drums? Uh, uh I th- thanks for the kind words, but really the timing. I want to, I want to touch on that for one second. The timing comes from not only just myself working at it. I mean, like, it's like a labor. It's like you never feel, I never feel cavalier. Oh, yeah, I've got this great sense of time, and I'm going to keep everybody in line. It's like, no, my timing is good because Butch has good time and Michael has good time, and we listen to each other, and, and, yeah. and Michael has really encouraged me to get out of my head and get into, like, what he's doing and what Butch is doing at all times 100%. And as long as I'm listening to Butch and Mike, and I'm and I'm deferring to them. I mean, I'm, I have I am the loudest guy in the band, so I have to keep time, and and I have to have a good sense of my own clock. But if we all three of us have a good clock, and we're listening to each other, the music will play itself. Yeah, right. I'm and sure. then we will groove together, and we'll be like one organism, sort of moving this way, as opposed to me trying to keep time and saying no, it's over here, and Mike saying no, it's over here, and Butch saying no, it's over here. No, we have a symbiotic relationship to the time. You know, it's funny you say that because I hear that a lot from the other musicians that we've had on here too. That some of the better ones, the the more the long ones that have done it longer, where they talk about listening. They talk about it's not always just doing your own job. You have to listen to everything that's going on, and there's a flow and a whole thing that goes into this whole it's thing. Right? All about listening to the other person. Michael has really uh, uh, challenged me on that over the years. When he joined the band, it's like my playing went to another level because because Butch wanted me to play certain things. That that the former bass player was not comfortable with. So, and he says Butch would say like, you know what I want to do, so do it. And then Michael knows what Butch wants to do, and so the three of us together, we we know f- from listening to each other where the music can go, where it wants to go. Sure, sometimes we'll hang ourselves. It's like, nah, that's a little too much nonsense. You know, let's rein it back. Like you were saying, we know what to do. We could go way out here, but that's not musical. What's the music telling us to do? Right, awesome. And is it supporting what Butch is doing while he's playing 
Is it supporting what Michael's doing? So we're listening all the time, and that's making that adjustment. So that kind of follows yeah, that. I love but, that. But going back to to my story, um, I have not. I don't come from a musical family. Uh, I was born in New York State, and then uh, when my mom died, my two brothers and I moved to Cleveland, and my natural father uh, was not musically inclined, but when I was in the third grade, I saw an episode of Batman and Robin, and Robin was playing a drum solo. <laughs> and you can see the video clip on YouTube. The, the, you're talking about the the, the the TV show? Yeah. Batman and Robin? Yeah. And so it was like a it was like a school day afternoon, and I'm watching Batman and Robin like I did every week, and and there's Robin he's playing a drum solo. It's like just two seconds long, and then all of a sudden the bat phone rings, you know, and, and so so Batman says, "Cool it, Ringo," and uh, and, and, and uh, I think uh, Alfred says, "I do believe, Robin, that's uh, or whatever the guy's name was." He goes, "I do believe that." At the talent show, they're going to call that what I term a doza. <laughs> and it was just really silly. But to see him play the drums like that, it was like I never saw anybody. I don't think I remembered anybody playing the drums before that moment. Right. And that was it. I'm done. That's I got to play the drums. So I run into the kitchen and I'm like, Dad, I want to play the drums. He's like, OK. So then he took me to a toy store. And uh, we're looking at this toy drum set with paper heads. And he says, is that what you want, Billy? And I said, no, because I knew. Somehow I knew. So then he took me to a place that Butch will remember, Bill D'Arango's music up on Richmond Road. Yeah. And uh, no, not Richmond, I'm sorry, on Warrensville Center near uh, Geraci's Pizza in Cleveland, in University Heights. You guys all have great memories, by the way. I got to tell you. Uh, <laughs> so... And so my dad bought me a Red Sparkle Tempro King drum set, and they delivered it to our house, and they set it up in the living room. And that lasted about a week, and then my dad's like, this needs to go in the basement. But I took some lessons, and then my grades weren't good, so my dad cut that out. And so then, so then that was the beginning. And my dad was a really colorful individual, and he would have parties and hire a band. Oh. And they would play right in the living room. That happened on at least one occasion. I just remember it was like, wow, my dad has a party and brings a band, you know. That's cool. But uh, <clears throat> but he passed when I was in the sixth grade, and then I was adopted by my cousins. And we wound up, um, they weren't musical either, but they supported the fact that I wanted to play the drums. So they set up a place for me in the basement, and I played all through high school and, and uh, played in the marching band and stuff. And then I went to college for two years and studied music, but college was a train wreck with partying too much and stuff like that. But I always knew I wanted to play. I didn't know what professional music really looked like. I didn't have anybody to, like, model myself after, like, in the family sense, you know, like somebody that was a professional that I knew that was like, wow, I could do this and this, and then I could do that, you know. And I didn't play in bands in high school because I kind of lived in the suburbs and didn't really have any other friends that could play, so... It wasn't until after high, high college that I um, moved out of the house and I just started making friends at jam nights and stuff. And this is back in like 1982, 83. And I would go to a jam night where guys would be playing with guitars and I would play the bongos. Oh. And then a guy says, hey, you play the drum set? We need a drummer on Saturday for a recording. And I was like, actually, that's my primary instrument. So... I, but I don't have a car, and then he came and picked me up in my apartment, and I recorded with these guys, and the next thing you know, I'm in their band, and and then that leads to another gig, and then, you know, you just kind of sure. start making the inroads. Yeah, once you get in, you can start meeting more people, and it's, right, it just right. kind of just like a, just follows like dominoes, right? I mean, that's kind of how it works. Yeah. And, and the thing about drums is that you always got to have cool – parents or cool somebody who allows the drumming right. thing because not everybody can be a drummer just on the fact that their parents wouldn't let them. <laughs> That's for sure. You know my brother's I mean? a professional drummer. I grew up with it. Yeah, right. I used to do my homework in the car. Yeah. Because he would practice all the time. Right. Yeah. Well, you got to learn to tolerate. I mean, yeah. there's, there's a certain level of tolerating yeah, that goes on with drumming. You have yeah. to, and you have to practice. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah my, right. my, uh, my, my step-parents, 
they are the they are as cool as ice, man. Nobody's more awesome. They really are. And and the, and the fact that they would be like, you know, okay, let's go get some more mattresses for the basement because we want this kid to practice, you know. But <laughs> but honestly, you know, like every parent, you know, they couldn't see the future in music. You know, it's like, well, so because because like when I was dropping out of college, my my mom and dad were like, so what are you gonna do with your life? You know, and so I tried to actually audition for the Navy band. But the thing is, you had to join the Navy before you get the audition. Oh. And the drag part of that is See, if you get in and you flunk the audition, they still have you. Yeah, you're, you're, now you're, now you're So yeah. the long story That's short wild. on that is I got rejected because of dry skin medicine that was a prescription. Huh. In 19, I don't remember that story. That was in 1982. Yeah, I, I went to the I went to the recruiter, and then I took my physical. I took the written exam, and then I went to the very. And then I'd already had this. Uh, uh, I had a dermatologist fill out this form that said, "Yes, this is your prescription for this dermatitis or whatever it is, and uh, psoriasis." So, so then after I did all the. The stuff downtown, I went to this last station where I had to go visit a doctor, and he says, hey, uh, by section code, blah, 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 so-and-so, I regret to inform you that we cannot accept you right now because of this condition you have. <laughs> and, and like, I can manage the condition with carry lotion, you know. Like, <laughs> right, yeah. Like, you know, and, uh, but, you know, that was, to me, that was divine intervention because uh, years later I went on tour to entertain guys in the service all over the world. So you're entertaining the one somebody yeah, you so almost were. We yeah. figured out that at one point one of the, the band you were in would have played at the base I was at in Japan oh. while I was there. Wow. Yeah, isn't that wild? Because he would that have been. Wild. He would have, so we were actually in the same country at, for a hot minute, but we didn't know it. Yeah, right. But yeah, yeah. in the nineties. That's amazing yeah. too, because totally you, you think about when you think about the numbers and the odds of things. Oh, like, it's like just a yeah. yeah. island in the middle of the Pacific, and we both at one oh. point would have been there because he starts talking about it. And I'm like, wait a minute. I would might have been there. <laughs> so how do you guys get in the band? How do you guys? How do you guys? How does this band form? How do how do you guys? Well, they already had a band together. Um, Butch and I knew each other, and Billy and I knew each other because of this jam night that I've been hosting for since 1994 with Michael Bay and the Bad Boys of Blues. And Butch is one of our hosts. And this is true. This is a true story. First, he's the second host we ever had. I just moved here three weeks before Michael Bay. I met him on the street literally walking down Clifton Avenue by 117th. And here's this Michael Bay, who's a, a mutual friend of all of ours. And uh, like I met him, talked to him, and two days later he calls me and he's like, you want to do a gig? And I'm like, you don't even know if I can play. And he's like, well, you sound like you know what you're doing. And so we did this jam night. The second week of it at Chiefs, remember? Yeah. He's the host. And this is back in 94. And Butch... You were cut. This guy was literally built. Your upper body was like a V, right? <laughs> this guy comes in with this muscle shirt. He's got the shaved head. 94, right? And he walks in with his guitar. And I walk over to Michael Bay. I don't know anybody yet in this town. I walk over to Michael Bay and I go, who's that? And he goes, that's our host. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, that guy? Really? So I go over to say hi to him, and he's like, hey, how you doing? You know, I didn't expect that. Like, that he's just such a nice guy, <laughs> you know? And he's like, so whenever he would host, you know, we would always hang out after a gig, and I can remember you and I sitting at a bar talking after the gig once, and you were like, man, that would be really cool if we could play together. And I was like, yeah, but you're in a band, and I'm already in a band. And years would go by, years go by, and then 16 years ago, would have been 17 now, I've, I've been in the band 16, he calls me, and he goes... Stutz is probably going to leave the band. You know, are you, would you be into it? And I was like, wow. And I was playing with a band called Walking Cane at the time. I don't know if you know Walking Cane. He's a blues guy. Roughly. I've heard of. So I didn't know what to do at first. So it took me a couple months to kind of situate like whether or not I was going to do it. Austin and I were really close and our kids were kind of the same age. So they were growing up together. But then he goes, listen, man, if you play with me, we're going to have a great time. You'll work all the time. And the one thing he said that I, this touches on what you said before, he goes, and I can tell you something. If you play in my band, you can play whatever you want, and I won't say anything. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know, man, really? <laughs> <laughs> you think that's a good idea? And he's like, no, I've heard you play. You and I have played together before. I'm never, and he, you know what? He really hasn't. 
that's, that's, <laughs> that's awesome. That's the whole idea of of the band from the beginning, even, you know, with the original members. When he got in our band, um, that um, the band is a the band is always about it's about freedom, you know. Okay, a lot of guys like they consider me the leader, right? But I'm basically okay. So you know, the original two guys are gone. These two guys are new newer guys. You could say that, but it's not like that. It's like they're just this is band. This band is just as much as theirs as it is mine. Okay, and that's why I want it to be, and and I I wouldn't do that with every anybody, because I know a lot of musicians that, that would take advantage of that, and they wouldn't know how to do that, not just take advantage, but they wouldn't know how to do it the right way. Correct. They would probably overplay and play the wrong things and just, you know, do do stupid things. I've I've no I've known people like that. Okay, that I would you know, but um, he got in the band. And I, I knew he was a really good, really good bass player. Uh, he had some big shoes to fill because Bearcat was, you know, a star too. Really good, yeah. And uh, soon, no sooner than he got in the band, I says, uh, uh, "Can you take a solo?" He goes, "Can I?" And I go, "Yeah, that's what I want you to." And then he sold and went, "Wow!" I says, uh, "Can you sing any songs?" He goes, "Can I?" I go, "Yeah." He sang and I go, "Yeah, okay, great." And he just like, whew. it was like all the years of him playing blues bass with blues bands, you know, he was just sitting on the porch in Mississippi playing, you know, the, the bass lines, you know, so it's basically, now he's got the ultimate freedom. Same thing with Billy, you know, Billy, I, I mean, the bands he played with before us, he had to play a certain, certain beats and that was it, you know, so now he's introduced to all these cool beats a lot of stuff he you know some some of the stuff we actually had to show him how to play when he first got with me and Stutz you know and uh, he had never played blues and rock stuff like that right and that's okay you know it's like that's sometimes that's better that way I play with many bands in my life that were so regimented we rehearsed all the time back in the disco days post disco days I played with R&B band, R &B band Goodfoot greatest band around okay Sometimes it was better than the real people. It scared me. Oh, really? I mean, it was you know, and all these all these disco bands you see nowadays that are doing tracks, and I won't mention any names. But we were, we were playing the real stuff and real singers, and the guys were the musicians were excellent, you know. And we pl we learned a new song a week, whatever was happening on the radio. And we sometimes we wouldn't even have to rehearse. We just uh, I forgot to buy the record, and I heard it in the car, you know, on the radio. I go, okay, I know what he's doing. And so, but we rehearsed and everything was the same way every night. And we got really good at that. But nothing beats the beauty of what we're doing when you go up and you don't, you know, you know, you know, you know the structure, but you, but you don't know what you're going to do from right. night to night. It's, it's always going to be different. Yep. Okay. You're complete freedom. He might take a solo for however long he wants to, but it'll always climax and come back to even a greater thing. Nothing beats the beauty of being able to walk up and not know what you're going to do and get really, really good at that. That's awesome. Mm. And that's that's the cool part. That's real musicianship, I think, yeah. so, too. It's, and it's, it's, everything has its own value. It, it, for what we're doing, to me, is the difference between a comedian like George Carlin and Robin Williams. Carlin was known to rehearse and practice his show and then do it for two years, and he, they said he even timed out exactly how long his segues were and how long it took. And then Robin Williams would walk into a room and react to everything in the audience and everything. That's what we're getting to do. Yeah. We have, like Butch said, it was perfect. We have a structure. It was beautiful, Butch. It <laughs> had, had a structure. And, but that's it. We just have kind of a structure. And then that just, for me, I'm driving to a gig and I'm excited because I know that something could happen tonight that's never happened. And these guys both still surprise me. Butch will do something, or Billy even. I'll be like, I've never heard him do that before. And you'd think after, I've been in the band 16 years, you'd think by now with all those gigs twice a day like we've done in years, for a long time we were doing sometimes seven to eight gigs a week. That's unbelievable. You know? no, one um, of, go ahead. One of, one of the best things about the whole conclusion of what I'm saying is once you get good at doing what you do every night, <clears throat> There's two songs in particular that we've done recently that we decided to do. 
One was, uh, I just got paid by ZZ Top. ZZ Top. And the other one is Gimme Shelter, which I was kind of like, for the first time where I was like, I don't know, Mike, I don't want to do it. Gimme Shelter, gonna, with the Floyd Stones, we're, we're not wild horses. You, know, you guys do a totally your version of that, well, too. Well, this yeah. would happen. Because of the way we play together, and we got so good at doing playing together in a certain way, that both those songs were never rehearsed. No, we all we, we never we never listened to the records. We just I just knew the riff. I knew a verse or two. There's about four or five verses. I don't know. I, I just sing the just two verses. Okay, it's it's better that way. We we made it into a 45 r- record. <laughs> you got you did the Three single version. Record. It's a single yeah. version. Yeah, we don't go no big long <laughs> jam. Yeah. And so um, what happened was uh, I just says, well, you know what? Yeah, you know, you know it, don't you? And I know it. And, and what you hear in the final product is exactly the way it came down the very first time we ever That's played true. it. And it's like, it, and I was, we just kind of amazed ourselves. Same thing with Give Me Shelter. We, we, he kept saying, we should do Give Me Shelter. And I kept saying, well, maybe we should rehearse that one. And he goes, no, 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 I got a great idea. He says, I'm going to play the Keith Richards part. No, that dun, 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 dun. He's on the bass. And I go, oh, that's a cool idea. All of a sudden, and Billy, you know it, right? Billy goes, yeah, I, I think I know it. <laughs> and we're, I think we were at Smedley's that night, right? Yeah. And, and So this is all happening right in a live it's time. It's happening in that way. said, I really want to do this tune, but we got to do it in A instead and of C sharp. Sudden, and here's, yeah, so we, we he trans, so Mike starts it off. Dun, 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 dun. And all of a sudden, you know, and all of a sudden, I came over me to pl- to play the Mary Clayton part. You know, that she sings that yeah. ooh, on guitar. I went with the violin sound, like Phil Chiegi or something oh, yeah, like Phil. that. You know, and as soon as we did that a couple times, four times, and then Billy just bow, da, 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 and just it just it just came alive. It's just like what the hell just happened? It was like it was something magical. That's cool because you guys, you guys have figured out. You guys are good enough, first of all, and you figured out how to do this music thing where it totally is a selfish, pleasing thing for you guys, exactly. and yet it resonates with everybody at the same right. time. Like you guys have figured that out. That's a how, tough balance. How many musicians are 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 by just by the way it is pigeonholed into something where you have to do something to appease people so that you have some kind of a career? You guys have figured out. You don't even need to think about that. Most, that. most musicians I know that are really great musicians, and there are great musicians, they will not attempt to play a song unless it's rehearsed. Yes, that's what I'm saying. It's right, right. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And f- we just take we just take our chances. We just we just go with it. Yeah, man. And and the common sense that we've had after playing, it's not of its common sense. It's like cooking, you know. Uh, the formula. It's like everybody kind of knows the way music should be in the back of our heads from playing so many years. We just automatically wrote the arrangement on stage. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and, that's and, so fun. And even the ending, the ending was like <laughs> this big crescendo ending, like a big concert ending. And then there was this like big bed clock. And, boom, 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 boom. and you got to kind of know each other's like... Those things require kind of like a tightness, right? Like, yeah. Like, well, that's that's. It was Im- three imaginations all getting together within four or five minutes. That's right. So cool, man. And and it just came down. I mean, we might have we might have cl- cl- tightened up a couple little things yeah. after that. Like I said, hey, maybe we here. Let's go this long instead of that long. And, right. But that's minimal. Yeah. But the the actual heart of the song and the and the and the gravity of it and the and the excitement of it, it was all. It just came like magic, like all at one time, mm. you know. And th- that's kind of like what Hendrix did, you know, on some of his records. You know, like you got this Eddie Kramer who's got these YouTube videos where he shows the different stages of Hendrix coming up with an idea in the studio. And by the third time he came up with it, I mean, he nailed it. You know, it's like, you know, he's and you can hear him creating it or like like the Beatle movie. Like yeah. when you see Paul writing uh, Get Back JoJo, remember? Yeah, yeah, the new Beatle movie. He's writing it right on the on the screen, you know, right in front of everybody, and he's got you know these. He's, it's coming. It's coming from somewhere. Yes, yeah, that, that's is, and and you guys are doing basically cover tunes, but you don't really look at it that way, do you? No, because it's, it's, the, at the end of the day, it's it's your own thing, right? I mean, no, it's right. just these are just like guidelines. We're not learning any. <laughs> yeah. Any. I don't know if we've ever done any songs note for. We don't do no. any songs note. Well, for you don't now. even rehearse. Them. 
No. <laughs> We've only had a handful of rehearsals in 16 years. That's so cool, man. Usually what will happen is, like, what with remember that, what was the one with the, the cult? There's a tune we do by the cult. Yeah. And I just called Butch, and I go, I want to do this tune called by the cult called Firewoman. And I told Billy, and... Um, I can't even remember if we ever rehearsed it. I know I called them and said, we got to do it. I think you got with Butch on that just for right. this little guitar thing. We did. We He and I got together just to watch. Plus, we had to transpose it because we changed keys. A lot of times we'll do that. You know, we'll do, That helps, just moving something out of whatever it was in. Because, you know, let's face it. I mean, you know, Hendrix covered all along the Watchtower, all these great artists. Very seldom... Our, most of our heroes would never have learned anything note for note. Yeah, right. They didn't do that. They took other people's tunes and did something with them. Yeah. Covers yeah. are cool if you change them around, I think. Yeah, right. You yeah. Know, do your thing. You know? Yeah, I mean, look at look at Bob Dylan. was Hendrix was covering a lot of the songs yeah. of Bob Dylan. Right, right. Who would have, who would have thought them two go together somehow, right? right? Like that's, You wouldn't. Right. right. They, but, but he made it his own. Right? Some, Could, sometimes we open up with this uh, long instrumental. It's a, it's a takeoff of Lowrider. By uh, war, Is by it war, yeah. And we don't sing it. We don't have no harmonica, and we just kind of like start it off, kind of like a real digital song. And it goes into about fifteen other songs, you know, with just everything that's. Kind of whatever we're feeling. <laughs> He's in the key is that, of is a. That, was that part of why you guys change keys so that you can meld other tunes with it and stuff like that? It kind of flows better. It comes or is down it... to voice with the Stones tune. It was because I was trying to figure out a way to play the bass line and the guitar part at the same time. Oh, oh, oh. So, which I actually, am, you know. So your hand structure on the I'm on the front board is easier if it's in a different yeah. key type thing. Well, so. a lot of times I also have these. I have this trigger on my bass that allows me to drop two different notes that they wouldn't oh. normally have on it. It's called oh. a hip shot. So a lot of times. I'm not actually playing in standard tuning. Oh. I'm hitting this trigger and it's changing tuning so that I can grab a bass line and still, you know, try to play a, you know, arguably I'm getting better at it. I'm trying to play the guitar part. And if I can get it far enough away, it sounds like there's two people. That's what I'm trying to do is have it be far. So we'll move keys sometimes because a voice or because of that, you know, <clears throat> but then that makes you creative. Because you're like, oh, this isn't, you know, the, the original one. So yeah, you're doing all something. Of a sudden, right. You might see something that you wouldn't have seen in the other key you know the, the bottom line is nobody tells anybody what to do in this no. band i don't tell him what to play i accept everything that he comes out of his mind same with billy I every mean, once in a while maybe billy played too much bass drum i'll say one less beat in there or something you know just yeah. a little little cr tiny criticisms other than that it's never criticism and, and even when we're on stage where there's no set list they go well what do you feel like doing let's do this okay uh, well, let's let's do this one now. Oh, okay, no, nobody ever. Says, you guys don't no. have a set list, really? When you go out there, no. you don't even, even, <laughs> even we have to, a song list. So just so just, a, just so you know, you can. Here. It's all up well, you guys all go. three have great memories. I guess this is sort of. I mean, we <laughs> we sometimes we? have like certain songs we like to do in the first set. Certain songs we like to put together in the second set. Yeah. But, but then there are some nights where we're just a little more relaxed and it's like, let's play a shuffle, you know? I yeah. want to play a shuffle. Or let's do, you know, we, or we're stumped. We don't know what to do, so we'll just pass it around and see who comes up with what, you know? That's cool. But there are some some nights where, yeah, you're going to hear this and you're going to hear that, and then the third set, you're probably going to hear that. But, but we're pretty loose. You know, and that's just, you just touched on the variety, too. That's one of the things I love about this band, too, with you, is because we do everything from the Stones to ZZ Top to the, Jeff The Beck. Cult. To Santana, to the Cult, and George Benson. Oh, really? Yeah, really. We have a whole. We can do a whole, at least an hour or two of jazz. You got you your know? George Benson going on in there well, too. Well, when you're when you're working Santana. for a living, sometimes you're playing a show where it's like we need a low key first set from the band, and maybe they really want you to be there, but they need it low key, so they're not gonna respond to Black Magic Woman in the first set. So I got you. we might play some smooth, you know, George Benson kind of cool jazz, and Butch will really shine, Michael will really shine, we'll keep a good pocket, and everybody's happy, and the club owner's like, fantastic, we love you guys, come on, do some more of that. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Real quick, so uh, we're going we're gonna to run out of time here. I can't yeah, believe fine. how fast this interview yeah, went. No, we got, we got some time still, but I just want to touch on something real quick. You came in here with this Major Hoople's shirt on, of the, it says Glenn Schwartz on it and everything. And, you know, I'm sure some people know this. I don't know if everyone does, but you're kind of a, a Schwartz disciple. You're one of the, you were one of the guys that, that came up with Glenn and learned from Glenn. And I, I've heard stories you've told already about some of the things about how, when he came around and how he taught you guys certain things that kind of like, 
propelled everybody into learning what people were even doing because he found out. He knew. He was one of the best guitar players that Cleveland ever had, ever. He was the best guitar player in the world. You, that's to me. That, hmm. to me. And, I mean, and 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 Joe, I've heard them all. You and Joe Walsh is another big name that that he's a part of. You know, he, like the, he the, was a second influence because when he left the James Gang, Joe got in there, and then we all followed Joe. You know, and that that's when I learned that you don't have to be exactly like somebody else, okay? Because you know, a lot of people they take somebody's place, they get criticized, but no, Joe Walsh was just as good as Glenn Schwartz, except. He had his own style. Yeah, a diff- little different. And that's right? what I I learned at a young age. That that's the way you got to think about yourself. You know, don't try to be too much like anybody else. Figure you know, out what you. Figure out who you are. Mm. Okay, Boy, that's good. That's, that's true. That's totally the way it is. Yeah. I mean, everybody, everybody's influenced. Like I was influenced by everybody. We grew up at the perfect time to learn how to play electric guitar. The electric guitar. <laughs> <laughs> it's, because as every as the guitar evolved, so did we. Our, our ears evolved, and, and we, I, this new guy came out, and then Johnny Winter comes out, and then and there's Jeff Beck, and then there's... Um, Come on, Eddie Van Halen. There's Roy Buchanan. There's Roy, <laughs> no, this is before that. And there's, there's Roy Buchanan. I'm talking way before that. And I bought every album and learned everything these guys did. You know, I OD'd on all the great guitar players. There's nobody I don't like. Really? Nobody. Because it's all great. You know. That's awesome, dude. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that. Really, well, I, it's all you, great yeah, stuff. That, that, but usually, there's somebody, there's something, or something that somebody's like, ah. But you don't look at it that way. You look at it like there's something to take from everything, right? Like everything's musically, it's all. I love everything that has to do with guitar. Even when the finger tapping style came in, a lot of the guys like they learn like me, like, oh, I hate that. I can't stand that. But it's 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 genius. It's it's unique. Yeah. And Frank Zappa hated it. You know, mm-hmm. but uh, you a Zappa fan too, or do you, you? Oh, everybody! I'm I'm everybody fan. Yeah, I guess there's, no, so. there's nobody that I that I didn't like. There's nobody I didn't learn from. Yeah, right. But Glenn Schwartz is top of the heat. He's right up there with everybody. Clapton, Hendrix. The only thing about Glenn is uh, uh, he you know, came back home, and he didn't want no part of the fame and fortune. He just decided to get out of that. And and a lot of people know the story. You know. Yeah. He got really religious, and God bless him. I mean, yeah, yeah. And he took that. He carried that forever after that. I mean, that was that was part of the. That was actually part of the gig, right? I mean, like he'd he'd be preaching. He'd be up there preaching while he's playing. Man, he preached with the guitar. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. I feel privileged that we got to play with them. Really, right, kind of before he passed, didn't we? We got to do that festival with Kent Blues Fest. That was really cool. Some of the some of the best years of his life were the last few years of his life because he was invited to go to play at Coachella with uh, um, the kid from the Black Keys and Joe Walsh. So he got and some recognition they, toward they the They brought him in front of yeah. thousands of people after all those years. And everybody, like he said, I want to tell you, introduce you to the guy that taught me how to play guitar, Joe Walsh says, and everybody went wild. I, mean, I, so I get chills and tears when I think about it, and it's on video. It's on YouTube. And he comes out and waves everybody, and everybody just accepted him like, wow, you know. That's that awesome, great. man. That is. That's a great story. And I and, and like I said, you can uh, – I did an episode with Drew Loesch, and he's got a video of you actually playing with, with Glenn. Yes. And you're telling the story of when Glenn came back. And mm-hmm. there was like – you were saying something about like there was certain guitar things that were go, these guys were doing, and you were like, how are they doing that? And when he came back, he's like, here's how they're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean <laughs> – uh, it's like, you know, we, all we had was records to put on and put the needle on the record. And after you put the needle and then figure out exact same spot, you know, that you want to, you know, hear the same riff, you're going to wear the record on, put a skip in it. So I bought many albums. Like I must have bought Are You Experienced four or five times. You know, because you it, wore out. <laughs> because I wore out the certain spots where I'm trying to figure out the licks. And um, it's amazing how backwoods everything was, you know, and, and, we, and then finally we... You know, because you, you really couldn't see Hendrix on TV. You couldn't see, you know, th- th- these people weren't on television. All you heard was the records on the radio and in the records at home. And then finally Glenn Schwartz comes and he plays the local dance hall. And he's playing all the stuff the way it's supposed to be done. And I go, sit there and watch him. Like, that's how you do it, you know. That's cool. So that's, that's what it was. That's cool. All yeah. right, guys, that's all the time we got. Awesome. Thank you so this much. Was, this, was, this was, a, yeah, this was a blast, man. You guys... This is this was 
It's about really? as much Thank fun you. as I've ever had doing this. That's, that's for cool. Sure. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Yeah, man. You guys, you guys are a blast, man. Thanks. I, I, I can't wait to see. I, I'm definitely coming out and seeing you guys. Come out and see us live. Am, dude, for sure, man. Cool. For sure. All right. Well, that's it from us. Some of the places these guys play at, Smedley's is one of them. Union House, we were just talking about some of these. You guys are playing uh, Mutt and Jeff's. Tonight. Uh, tonight. Tonight, actually. Well, yeah, right. The not green, really tonight. You should but plug not tonight. really tonight. <laughs> Every Tuesday, Butch this has be a way back night. In Yeah, this is April. But yeah, this, yeah, but still, eighth. but still, you guys, the, the, you guys play a rotation of the same kind of the same bars over and over again. What about the sand trap? What's going on with the sand trap? I know, I know that there's you guys are associated with that in some way, and it's just reopened, right? Right, right. What's up with that? Are you guys going to be Tuesday? We are we going to be back there? I'm I'm hosting the jam with my son and our cousin Sandy. Uh, it's, we call it Butch Armstrong and the Family Jam. Oh, cool! And it's uh, it's Billy's the drummer and uh, Jeff Jarek. Uh, is the son of Jeff Jarek and uh, Bill Jarek is his uncle, original James Gang guitar oh, player. Oh, wow. He used to put Glenn Schwartz on his shoulders. <laughs> so his nephew is in the band playing bass. He's great. And um, So you guys have spawned some, some musicians I'm also the, along the way, I huh? Get, I get to play with the kids every two. <laughs> yeah, that's cool, man. That's cool. You know, cool. Then Billy's got, uh, you got to tell him about the drummer karaoke. Oh, uh, I do this thing once a month called uh, Drum Karaoke. Really? It's called, you can go to my f Facebook page, Billy Coakley's Karaoke Drum Night. Where's it at? It's at the Brothers Lounge. Oh, you do it at the Brothers Lounge. And uh, so I have two drum kits on stage, and then I'm the, the host DJ MC, and then people come up and they tell me what song they want to play, and they sit down and they play their favorite song. I had 26 drummers last month. Wow. So are you, cool? are you, <laughs> this is amazing. So you, so they're playing drums, not singing. Yeah, yeah I have two complete drum kits. And you have the song. Minus the drums coming yeah. out. The no, no, speaker. no. I did. They just play the regular tracks. Some people will show up with a flash drive, oh, and maybe oh. they have a custom made track, or they have their phone. But yeah, and 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 uh, basically, they just put the headphones on. The music is cranked through the front of the house, and then I have a separate mix for the, each person, so I can get their volume just right before they play, and so. People out front aren't hearing the music and the guy trying to figure out how if it sounds right or not, you know. Awesome. Then awesome. once everything's dialed in, they say I'm ready, and then I turn it up, and it's really a hoot, man. People are having a great time. I'm getting, you know, really good performers. I'm getting beginner adults, you know, that just need to get on stage. You know, they're not really ready for a band. So you get That's, everything. You get all walks of life coming oh, up, drummers-wise. And yeah, it's just yeah, a yeah. blessing. I have a couple of nice endorsements, so it helps me to continue to be uh, a, a presence in the community for their products, you know, because I want to I wanna work for them. They treat me well, and I want to be a, a good representative. And I love bringing the drum community together. We all have a blast. That's cool. That's cool. It's a great hang. And one thing i got to plug are Thursdays. Um, I'm not, for sure. I'm, the reason I'm in this band is because of it. Thursdays, uh, are, we have an open mic jam. Uh, with Michael Bay and the Bad Boys of Blues. We've been doing it since 1994. And um, it was packed on Thursday. So if you want to come out and play, come out. Brothers it's, Lounge. Uh, Brothers Lounge. Another Brothers Lounge gig. Cool, yeah, man. Awesome. That's a great place for music. It's it's a beautiful stage. And we love we play there, too. Our band plays that's there. Another, yeah, it's another yeah. one of the venues you guys are yeah. playing there. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Butch. Thank you. Mike. Billy, I appreciate you guys coming. Thank you so this much. Is, this was a lot Thanks of fun. Thanks for having us. Yeah, this is a blast, man. This is cool. great. All right, guys, walk, keep your eyes out for them. Armstrong Bearcat, you guys have heard of them for years, decades. They've been around doing this, and they'll be playing out all summer. You should be able to catch them in any one of oh, the yeah. places we mentioned, if not a couple of Armstrongbearcatband.com. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's the website, yep. armstrongbearcatband.com. Yep. All right, guys, we'll Thank see you, you next week. See you later. Thank you. Bye. That'll be fine.